So thanks for the great introduction, Craig. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to start off by telling you a little bit more about myself. So um, I started as a faculty, uh, as an assistant professor at University of Maryland in uh, 2004, and I've been a faculty there ever since then for, uh, for the last 11 years or so. So the interesting thing about me is I spent an extended sabbatical at Twitter from 2010 to 2012. Um, and then, so I like to say to my colleagues, you, I came out of the ivory tower um, and onto the factory floor where I spent two years building shit that actually works. All right. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about what I worked on uh, there. So um, this is a high level architectural overview of the Twitter stack, if you will. At the top is what you imagine um, when you interact with the Twitter service. These are the API endpoints, the web servers, et cetera. So in the middle there, there was a big data collection layer um, that's uh, in these, uh, uh, mentioned by these boxes here that sucks in all the data into the Hadoop data warehouse. And this is sort of the central gathering point for <clears throat> all the data. So the logs, the tweets, uh, the graph, everything. Um, and so what do you use this for? Well, you use this for what people are calling data science these days and the creation of data products. And so I worked on the team that managed the analytics infrastructure to support data science and data products. So that was number one. The second is I worked on a lot of products to uh, surface relevant content to users. Right? So um, I got to dabble in a lot of uh, different systems. So um, real-time search is one of them. I also got to play with uh, searching users. I also got to play with uh, the WTF project, which is graph recommendations. This is actually what I'll be telling you uh, the most about the uh, focus of most of the talk. I also worked on real-time query suggestion. I'll come back and talk about this uh, a little bit. Um, and so it was, oh, slides. So it was an amazing ride. So let me tell you sort of the, the, the process that I went through, right? So when I got there, this was uh, 2010, um, the Hadoop cluster that housed the data warehouse, about 60 Hadoop nodes. There are about half a dozen people that are using the system on a daily basis. Um, the company itself was around 150 people. I think I was employee number 170 or something like that. By the time I left, these were the statistics, and this is already several years ago, right? So the company had grown about an order of magnitude in terms of size of employees. Um, we're running tens of thousands of Hadoop nodes across multiple data centers, holding tens of petabytes of data, and there were dozens of people running tens of thousands of Hadoop jobs daily. So it was an incredible ride seeing the scale up from this sort of you know, small scale operation to a real big data operation. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is that it actually came back. So I think there was sort of like an informal uh, pool between my colleagues on, is, you know, is uh, you know, Jimmy going to come back to academia? And, and so I'll share with you some of those experiences at, sort of at the end. And my mo most recent development is actually I'm leaving the University of Maryland. I'm moving to the, uh, I'm moving to the University of Waterloo in Canada uh, at the end of the summer. OK. All right. So, um, since I'm a lecture theater here, right, I always like to justify to my audience, you know, why you should be paying attention to me or, you know, or you can listen to my reasons and decide to doze off anyways, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some war stories from my experiences at Twitter. I'm going to try to generalize them into sort of lessons learned uh, and extract them from um, the, the details out of them. And then I'm going uh, to try to talk about what I think are personally uh, future interesting directions in this research directions in this area. And finally, for you know, PhD students, I'll come back to this very important question. So you can fall asleep for like 40 minutes and wake up at the end. I, I'll muse a little bit, you know, why are you getting your PhD? All right. OK, all right. So in case you're going to fall asleep anyways, let me just start by um, giving you the lessons and summarizing from the beginning. Right? So the takeaway lesson number one is this. Um, and it's you know, actually shared by, by this fellow here that you probably would know. Um, he says, you know, make things as simple as possible but no simpler, right? So that's lesson number one. Second lesson is, um, uh, second lesson, of course, we have to count it binary here, is constraints aren't always technical. So it seems a little bit odd. I'll offer you the context in a minute, and you'll, you'll, you'll see what that means. And the second here, and the third, third lesson here, of course, is that plumbing matters. Once again, this might also seem a little odd, but I'll come back to it, and it should, should make sense at the end. OK, all right. So the focus and the background of this talk, and I'll sort of guide you through the development of this project, is WTF. OK. It's not what you think it is. It stands for who to follow. 
And if there are um, grammar geeks in the audience, right? I mean, you guys probably speak proper English, right? You would say that this is not grammatical. It should actually be whom to follow, right? So I always point that out to somebody you know, in the audience doesn't point it out for me. Okay, so what is this project, who to follow, right? It is this, these little boxes that you, you see in the uh, Twitter web interface and it's also on the mobile interface of uh, follow recommendation, right? So it suggests accounts that you should follow uh, based on graph characteristics, demographic characteristics, uh, shared interest, uh, the text of your tweets, et cetera, right? So it's a graph recommendation engine. You see these types of services in LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera, right? Okay, uh, and this, uh, the original product launched in summer of 2010. Right. Okay, so this is a pretty cool system, and here's a little anecdote I like to share. Right. So this is a colleague of mine, um, uh, Kevin and Elizabeth Wheel. They got a Twitter handle for their baby that wasn't born yet. This is a very Twitter thing called Third Wheel. Get it? Elizabeth Wheel, Kevin Wheel, Third Wheel, and. Uh, they weren't ready to sort of share it, uh, the news that they were pregnant with their family, but they had created this account. So what happened was the system said, started recommending this account to all their, uh, all their uh, parents and fam family and friends, and so they reverse engineered and figured out that they were pregnant, which is kind of cool. So the system actually outed their news before they were ready to tell the world. All right. Okay. So I'll share with you some numbers. These are always fun. People always like to know, well, how big it is, uh, how much data do you have? So um, at that point, this is during the second half of 2012, uh, we have a triple dub paper about this uh, that we wrote up last year, so if you're interested in the details. So 175 million users. It's a big but not too huge graph, 20 billion edges. About 42% uh, of the edges are bi-directional, so I follow you, you follow me. Uh, average shortest path length is about four, so four degrees of separation. The interesting thing about the final, the final, the uh, second to last one is that there are 40% as many unfollows as there are follows on a daily basis. So people are really curating the people that they follow. Right? This is like, I follow you, I think you're boring, I unfollow you, I follow somebody else, et cetera. Right? This is like curation of attention. And then this service I'll be telling you about is about responsible for uh, around an eighth of the total uh, links and edges that are created in this graph. All right. Okay. So it all starts with FlockDB, which is the uh, the database that stores the graph, the system of record for the graph. Right. And it essentially is a thin layer on top of MySQL. At the bottom, at the core, it's uh, stored in uh, MySQL databases. Right. And it offers simple graph operations create, uh, remove, delete, update your CRUD operations, right? And also simple set interaction, uh, set intersection, and you need the set intersections to deliver uh, at replies, okay? And so um, it should be fairly clear, fairly obvious that this is not the system uh, that you want to be using for your graph analytics, right? That this is the system that the, uh, the users are hitting when they are following somebody or unfollowing somebody, right? So you want to separate the analytics from, from, that, data, uh, from that data source. All right, so this is, uh, this is here. This is essentially where FlockDB is, right? So there's a graph that talks to the front end of Twitter, and then the graph periodically gets adjusted into the Hadoop data warehouse. Right. OK, so um, the, 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 the most obvious solution is to, well, you know, we have this Hadoop data warehouse, right? And so we want to build graph recommendation algorithms. So let's just use Hadoop, right? So, um, some of you might be familiar, particularly if you work in this area and have some experience of this, you might already know that MapReduce, the MapReduce programming model on top of Hadoop, really sucks for graph algorithms. And there's been a whole series of papers in the last five to seven years documenting this fact, right? So there's all sorts of issue. You know, Java's very verbose. MapReduce forces you to write in Java. There's a long task startup time for the scheduling. You run into these issues with stragglers. There's all lots of issues with taking the graph and having to shuffle and reshuffle the graph around. And then you have to do frequent checkpointing, right? Okay. so. Um, and there's been a lot of systems that people have uh, published in the literature that attempts to solve all these problems. I've just sort of listed some of these. But I just want to note that most of these systems did not exist when we were tackling this problem in 2010. So that they're really not, not much help. All right, so if MapReduce sucks for graph algorithms, well, what's the next sort of logical solution? Well, the next logical solution is let's build our own system, right? So we made a very interesting 
design decision uh, in, in, building, uh, in building the system. And that was, we're going to first keep the entire graph in memory. OK, that in itself isn't very controversial, right? Hitting disk is going to be too slow, so you're going to keep everything in memory. But this subsequent decision is slightly odd. We're going to keep the entire graph in memory on a single machine, right? Now, you say this is nuts. This is absolutely nuts, right? This it goes against everything that we've been taught about building scalable distributed systems, right? You scale out using commodity machines. You don't scale up by throwing more memory at it, right? But this was exactly the solution that we adopted, right? And I'll tell you sort of why. why? The, the answer is, you know, basically we can. So if you do a back in the envelope calculation, a graph with 20 billion edges like I showed you, it's big, but it's not that big. So on the, it'll actually fit in memory on the upper end of uh, commodity scale machines, right? Um, so the alternative would be to build a distributed partition system, right? But you know graph partitioning is hard. I mean, we've made some inroads to it, but it's still a real, really hard problem. So if it's a hard problem, don't do it. <laughs> if you can avoid doing it, then don't do it, all right? OK, and so this allows you to have a very simple architecture, keep everything on a single machine, uh, buy lots of memory, and then it really boils down to this question, right? Um, the graph is growing, but Moore's law is also doubling the amount of memory you have in the next generation, right? So it comes down to sort of this bet of what do you think is growing faster, right? The size of your graph or the more resources that Moore's law are providing for you, right? And we did some back of the envelope calculation. We said, ah, yeah, you will be fine for a couple years. Right. So we ran with the solution, basically. So it was the right choice at the time. Right. OK, so uh, the, the, the team built out the system called Cassavery. Another sort of interesting fact is that everything in Twitter, at least for a long time, had to be named after birds, all the projects. So this is a Cassavery. It's a fierce looking bird um, native to Australia, I believe. OK, so what is it? It's an in-memory graph engine. Um, it's uh, implemented in Scala. Uh, Twitter also has this thing where they don't like Java, they like Scala. But it's essentially like I describe to people, Scala is like Java for hipsters, right? So uh, yeah, so it's implemented in Scala. Um, uses compact memory representations, but no, uh, no compression. So uh, uh, basically the thing, uh, we're basically, it's almost like coding C in Java, right? You start off allocate these really big memory arrays and you just do memory management yourself. Um, and it's open source, you can find it on GitHub. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about it, you know, how we run algorithms, right? The, the first thing, right off the bat, like if it's a graph, right, you gotta, you gotta run PageRank, right? Okay, so this is how we run PageRank on it. We run it in a, what we call sort of like a semi-streaming mode. So what, what happens is it's actually fairly easy to keep the, uh, the PageRank vector in memory, right? It's just a number of nodes and a floating point value for each uh, node, right? So what we do is we keep the vertex state in memory, and then we simply stream through all the edges, right? And then a stream through all the edges will allow you to compute one iteration of page rank, right? And so you essentially bottleneck by how fast you can pump the edges through, through your memory bus into the processor to update the values, right? OK, the next thing question that you would ask is, well, what about convergence, right? Because that's one pass is, uh, is one iteration of page rank, but you got to run, run in its own convergence, right? So it actually doesn't. It doesn't, it's not that big a problem because we never run this from scratch, right? If you run it from scratch, it'll take a while to converge, right? But what we do is we always initialize a page rank vector with the values from yesterday, right? And so essentially what we're doing is simply updating the values uh, based, on, uh, based on the new edges that have been created since the last uh, graph import, right? So this doesn't seem to be that big an issue. <clears throat> so a few passes in practice are sufficient to converge. Okay. So um, diving a little bit more into algorithms. So there's this thing that we developed called circle of trust. And it's an order set of uh, neighbors for the user. So it's essentially the result of a personalized random walk. And this essentially gets done online at query time. So at query time, you specify uh, the personalized page rank uh, ego center, where you want to do it from, the number of steps, uh, reset parameters, and whole other things. And it just runs it. Right. And this is a feature that's also used in other parts of the company. So this is used for uh, personalization in search. You want to upweigh things that are close by in your neighborhood. This is also used for, I believe, ad targeting and a whole bunch of other things. Right. So <clears throat> on top of this, 
I would, I would characterize this as our sort of our baseline <laughs> algorithm for doing recommendations on the graphs. So we came up with a way of doing recommendations based on salsa. So if you're familiar with sort of random walks, salsa is a random walk on a bipartite graph. And so the interesting thing about it is instead of uh, walking on a graph, on, the, on this bipartite graph, uh, what you would do is you take a step uh, from one direction to the other and then back or, then, or, or the other way around. Okay, so you have, uh, you can in interpret this sort of like a hubs and authority type uh, algorithm with hubs on one end and uh, authorities on the other end. So what we put on the left is a circle of trust of a user U that we're trying to make recommendations to. Right? Uh, and then on the right hand side, we put the users let the left hand side follow. We'd run the salsa algorithm, you know, these random walks back and forth uh, until it converges. And then we can take the hub scores on the left and um, interpret them as similarity scores for users, right? So these are users that are close to you and that, that make good recommendations. And also, you would, uh, uh, then you would interpret the scores on the right as the actual recommendation scores, and these are also what you would recommend to users, right, for slightly different reasons. Right, so um, here's, uh, here's an evaluation of how well this works. Uh, this is also presented in a triple dub paper uh, a couple of years ago, so if you're interested, you can um, go, uh, go and look up the details. So I'm not allow you to, uh, allowed to show you the real numbers, uh, so they've basically been normalized. The metric that most, uh, most evaluations of this type go in is uh, FTR. So this is like click-through rate, except it's not click, it's follow. So this is for the fraction of follows that you've been offered, how many do we actually follow, right? So it's like click-through. Um, so the baseline algorithm is first slice paid. Uh, the baseline algorithm is this closure-based algorithm. So you have um, um, parts of the graph that you want to close. Um, that's a reasonable baseline that's been presented in the literature. If you normalize to that, uh, MCM is most common neighbors. Sim is cosine similarity. Uh, uh, personalized page rank. So these are all classic algorithms, standard algorithms that uh, you would read about in the literature. And this salsa algorithm does fairly well. Right. Okay, so the complete architecture, putting everything together, looks something like this. So you have FlockDB. That's a database that's uh, maintaining the graph in real time. Right. There's a nightly import that takes the contents and dumps it to HDFS, the Hadoop distributed file system. So this serves as the backbone, the core of the data warehouse. Right? So uh, after the import on a nightly basis, it gets loaded into Cassavery. And then all Cassavery does is it sits there churning through the user base, uh, offering recommendation for user one, for user two, for user three, user four, blah, blah, blah. And then goes cycling through essentially all the users and puts the results and just essentially caches them in a database that is uh, named originally uh, the WTD, uh, WTFDB. <clears throat> On the front end, there is the API endpoint that actually serves the request, and there is um, what we call the fetcher, the basically, that just fetches things out of the, the DB. Right. So if you look at this architecture, one thing that you might have noticed is that this is a batch uh, this is a, a, a batch type approach, right? So what about new users, right? Because this, this nightly import happens, uh, happens only, only on a periodic basis, right? So what about new users that come in between? Right? This is commonly known as a cold start problem, right? So if, uh, if, you, you, if you just start off as a user, you actually lead recommendations the most, but it's also the hardest to generate the recommendations for you. So what do you do? Well, to solve that problem, we actually built in a separate code path there that essentially combines you know, any information that you have in Cassavery with the results of the uh, live FlockDB records and then merges them together to create some real-time recommendation. And essentially, the Blender API does brokering among the different options. Right? OK. All right. So, um, this project started in spring 2010, so right, right, it started before I actually got there, but this was sort of the first one I had an opportunity to contribute. There was no graph recommendation service, right? And it's like, seriously, WTF? This is a WTF, right? I mean, this was a sorely needed product, right? And then um, it launched, in uh, launched later that summer, and so it was a quick um, release cycle from the conception to coding to production deployment. Right. And so this comes back to this takeaway lesson number one. Right. So make things simple, but no simpler. 
Right. So you probably have heard about this um, in the context of what Google talks about, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. Right? Don't worry about algorithms. Just sort of throw, throw more data at it. This is sort of another a slant on it. Right? This is like um, with lots of data, algorithms don't really matter. It's, it, it does that, that is actually true to a large extent for particular problems. Right? But I'm talking here about our architectures here. Right? Why adopt a complex? distributed architecture if a simple one will suffice, right? So I can tell you that had we decided to you know, build this distributed graph recommendation engine, it would have been fun from an engineering point perspective, right? Because you would get to tackle all these cool core computer science problems like graph partitioning, blah, 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 right? But I can almost guarantee you we would not have launched in a quarter or about two quarters, right? So keep things simple. All right. So um, let me move on to the second lesson then. OK, so this was about uh, 2010, right? Fast forward you know, about, um, uh, about a year or so. So what happened next was we made another interesting design decision. Okay. What we did was we went from Casselberry, we built this you know, system, right? And we threw it away. And we went back to Hadoop. Okay. And you're like, what? That's nuts, right? You already told me nuts, and you also convinced me. I'm starting to buy the scale up argument, you know, large memory machines, right? And then you tell me you threw it all away to go back to Hadoop. Okay, so, so why? Well, I sort of already told you the answer, right? The Castlebury was really meant to be a stopgap measure, right? We said, well, you know, this was a fast, um, cheap, and dirty solution. We have more memory, but we probably will eventually run out of memory. So let's just deploy the system, get a product out there, and then sort of come back and iterate. So um, what does Hadoop provide, right? Hadoop provides a whole variety of other things, right? So it provides, uh, allows you to have a richer graph structure. So it's OK, it's fine to keep the graph in memory. You'll probably have enough memory to do that. But as soon as you start wanting to attach things to the graph, like annotate it, add in different types of edges, uh, features on the edges, features on the vertices, it, it'll blow up. Like you won't have enough memory to, to richly annotate a graph. Right? And we want to use all the information that we have, and so this was a limitation. Right? Um, another, another, uh, another important consideration is essentially laziness. Right? So, so here's what happens. You know, uh, Twitter has already, a, at that point, a pretty reasonable Hadoop infrastructure for managing jobs, for error reporting, for scheduling, and things like that. I'll come back and talk about those things, right? And so here we are off building this Casselberry system, and then we had to manage the own machines. They were slightly different, didn't really plug completely into the Hadoop infrastructure. And so it was sort of a nightmare to manage, right? So if we just move the system back onto Hadoop, we can say, oh, we don't need to manage it. The Hadoop team will manage it for us. Okay, out of sheer Laziness, if you will, right? So that's another issue, right? Uh, you can hook into sort of the production pipeline uh, infrastructure that's already been built by another part of the company, right? Okay, uh, and 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 I would, you know, I would I would complain that it was the right choice at the time. Okay, all right. So I just told you, right, that um, MapReduce sucks for graph algorithms. So why are we going back to run MapReduce jobs on uh, on Hadoop, right? Um, so what exactly is, is the issue? So if you sort of delve into it, like consider this, this, this egocentric two-hop neighborhood that you have to reconstruct for personalized page rank. Right? So personalized page rank, you're doing a random walk along the egocentric neighborhood for a particular user. Right? So the, the naive way of doing it is uh, you would want to uh, join the graph with itself, do a self-join on the graph, right? materialize a two-hop neighbor for, neighborhood for a particular uh, user, and then you actually just do the random walk, right? So if you try to do this in Hadoop, it's, it's the shuffling that kills you. It's the fact that you're joining the graph, which is already fairly big with itself. You're shuffling the data around, and you can easily generate terabytes and terabytes of intermediate data, which is not good, right? And so what we did, um, and we're, we're still, we've been trying to write this up for a while, uh, but the, we are trying to address the core issue of tackling this shuffling problem. Um, and so uh, I don't have time to go into the details of the solution, but it's basically based on this insight. So what we do is, uh, uh, is instead of trying to materialize the two-hop neighborhood, what we do is we store a lot of partial random walks. 
And when we want to generate the personalized random walk for a particular user, we sort of cleverly stitch them together. And uh, using this idea and the insight of uh, some clever sampling, we're able to avoid full materialization. Right? And then basic, uh, basically, based on the insight from the first version of the WTF algorithm, the Salsa algorithm that we uh, built out in Cassavery, it was, it, was unreasonably, um, it was reasonably straightforward to develop specific optimizations to actually make the, make the job run reasonably fast in a Hadoop-based environment, despite all the issues associated with uh, graph algorithms in Hadoop. Right. OK, so the next thing that we can do on top of it, once we move to a Hadoop, inf uh, uh, Hadoop infrastructure, is we can throw machine learning on it. So instead of just the follower graph, the original graph that we we're playing with, we can also uh, manifest the retweet graph based on behavior, the favorite graph, all lots of other activities, and sort of throw it all together into machine learning architecture. And this is pretty standard. Right? So you have all the graph, you do candidate generation, you get out a whole bunch of candidates for a particular user. And then with all these other data and the log data that we have, um, you can run a trained model, you can train up a model, and just simply uh, treat it as a classification problem. You do candidate generation, and then you say, you know, is this a good candidate or not? And those are the results. All right. Okay, so this is the end of the, uh, the second lesson, right? So this is like takeaway lesson number two, right? Constraints aren't always technical. Right? So if you say that, you know, I want to approach the problem and say I, I want to do technically the right thing, that is often at odds with actually solving the problem for that particular, for that particular case. Right? In the particular case of the, the, the first iteration of WTF and Cassavery, the, the problem was getting the product out as quickly as possible. Right? In the second iteration of the problem, we went away from that because uh, for essentially non-technical constraints. OK, um, so let's go back to this really neat picture here, right? So this is a, I, I would say this is like a fairly simple and straightforward architecture, right? You take all the data, you generate candidates, and then you train up a model and you do classification, right? OK, but um, do, do you guys like read the PhD comics? OK, this is like one of my favorite uh, uh, favorite uh, comics from there, right? So there's the scientific method, what you're supposed to do, like formulate hypotheses and then test the hypotheses and then modify the hypotheses, right? Okay, um, of course, this is not what we do. No, but this is, of course, joking, right? So I, I think this sort of applies to this. This is, this is an idealized picture of what's supposed to happen. But in truth, it's a lot messier, right? Okay, so. The fantasy is this, like if you work at a, as a data scientist, like if you, you guys aspire to be data scientists in the future, right? This is sort of the, the idealized way of, you know, a, a vision of what you think you're supposed to be doing, right? You approach a problem, you extract out the features, you develop some cool ML technique or something like that, and then you're done. Profit, right? Okay, right, so, so here's the actual reality, right? So the actual reality is you first, spend a lot of time thinking about what the problem actually is and what you're trying to actually optimize, right? So, you know, people say, you know, optimize click-through rate or optimize follow-through rate or optimize revenue, but the, the truth is, if you just optimize on that, you can get yourself into very perverse incentive structure and do really, really weird things. So it's more than that, okay? So you first, you gotta figure out, you know, what it is that you're trying to actually do, right? And, and this might conflict with what your boss wants, the execs want, blah, 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 right? Okay, and the next thing is you gotta figure out where the data are, right? Like, I, I, I'm a data scientist, I need to know where the data are. This turns out to be more complicated than it is. I'll tell you, I'll give you some examples later. Right. Then you're like, okay, I found the data, I'm gonna poke at it, I'm gonna look into it, and I'm gonna do exploratory data analysis. I'm gonna find out what's in the data, all right? And then you invariably say, ah, oh. Okay, As, like, you can bleep it out later if I like start cursing on camera or something like that. Okay, but anyways, like, there is, I can tell you this, there is no real world data set that I've ever encountered that doesn't have major issues with it. All right, okay, so you clean the data. That's what you gotta do. You gotta clean the data, clean the data, clean the data. And then, uh, then you do your feature extraction once the data set's already reasonably clean, and then you actually do the machine learning, right? And then doing the machine learning really boils down to like, you use Volpo Rabbit, or you use Weka, or you use whatever, right? So it's not 
it's not interesting at all. It's like using and pulling out an off-the-shelf tool and just like using it. Uh, and, and even if you write your own sort of tool, it's some variant of stochastic gradient descent, which isn't particularly interesting. All right. OK. Uh, and then it doesn't work, and then you iterate. OK. All right. So most applied machine learning projects in industry really are not applied, uh, really are not about applied machine learning, uh, about machine learning per se. All right. So there's this wonderful quote from DJ Patel. He's one of the uh, two people that are, um, that's credited for coining the term data science. And he says, you know, 80% of the work in any project is basically data cleaning. All right. There was a New York Times article a while ago of Monica Rigotti, who is a, a Jawbone's vice president for data science, and basically says a lot of the, 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 the essence of data work is really plumbing. It's like janitorial, really grungy, like really silly things that you have to do. All right. OK. All right. So I'll tell you, illustrate this with a few specific examples from my own experience at Twitter. OK, so you arrive at Twitter, you're a new hire, let's say, right? And you're like, OK, where, where are the data sets, right? I want to get access to all the tweets, right? I mean, I, I, I've been playing with a, with a sample hose for a long time now in my own research, but I want all the tweets now, right? Or I want all the entire graph. OK, but internally, in, inside Twitter, tweets are called statuses. Favorites are called favorings. Retweets are called chairs. Right? So in like HDFS, the, the directory or the name of the data set is called statuses. Right? And you're like, how would I know that? And if you just sort of browse through all the data sets available in the data warehouse, none of the titles would have any meaning to you. Like they just, they're, just, they're just historical oddities, basically. Right? Okay, so that, that's, that's a problem, right? Just finding out wow, like where, where's the data set that you need? Where are the data sets that you need? Right? Okay. So here's another one of my sort of favorite examples. Okay, naming things. Okay, so um, people code in a lot of different languages, right? So um, you might name your variables in like camel case. Like this is if you're an old school like Perl hacker, right? Um, if you're like a Java hacker, you would name your variables like this, right? Um, if you're ver even older school, like old school C hackers, right? No, underscores, right? Okay, and then if you accidentally switch languages, you'll mix them up, <laughs> all right? Uh, and then maybe the dunder snake too. Also, I think this is like uh, what convention is? I don't even remember. But some people actually do this, all right? And so these name uh, uh, variable uh, naming conventions are all in the code base somewhere, all right? Okay. So why is this important? Okay. Let me ask you a question, right? You want a data set. The data set is indexed by a primary called user ID, right? OK, what do you think user ID is? <laughs> They're all of those in all the data sets that are out there, right? OK, so imagine you're working on one data set created by one part of the organization, another data set created by another part of the organization, right? And to do insight and to generate insights, to do analyses, you got to join them together, right? That assumes you know how to find the primary key on which to join, right? There's your problem. That's a naming problem, All right? Okay, I'll give you another one. Let's talk about feature extraction, right? So you end up doing feature extraction with something like this. <laughs> All right. This is an actual Java regular expression. A while ago, I dug it from the, the internal Git repos uh, at Twitter. All right. Used to parse logs. And you can sort of see what's going on. It's this, I think, an Apache log. It's, oh, it's made even more fun because in Java you have to like back, double backslash everything, right? So it just makes everything twice as long. OK, so mercifully this has been decommissioned and I think it's, it was removed several years ago. OK, all right. So all the things I'm telling you about are kind of silly. Like they're kind of like small issues, right? You know, finding where things are, naming things, right? Um, and then monstrosities like these, right? But, but this adds friction to the development process, and they're cumulative, right? Imagine like yourself as a data scientist, and you're just peppered with these all day long. It slows, it slows down development. All right. OK. All right, so let me offer, try to you know, put everything together at a higher level and sort of tell you uh, the story of an example of a data plumbing 
project gone wrong, right? This is data plumbing not done right. Okay, so the scene I wanna present for you is some unnamed consumer internet company in the Bay Area. All right, okay, so on the one hand, you know, these are the cast of characters. You have the front end engineer, whose job it is to develop new features, and uh, he or she is tasked with uh, adding the logging code, right, to actually keep track of like the clicks or whatever. The other cast uh, in, the, in the cast of characters is a data scientist, right? He, uh, his or her job is to analyze a user behavior, extract out features, and you know, do something interesting with it. Okay, so here's what happens. Right, the, the data scientist you know, rolls up their sleeves and says, oh, hey, you know, let's get going. Where's the click data? Right? Remember the finding things problem I told you about? Okay, so you solve that problem. You ask the front end engineer, and they say, oh, it's over here. And you're like, mm. okay, well, that's kind of silly, why would you put it over there and why would you arrange it this way, but, but fine. And then you know, the front engineer starts slightly getting defensive, like, well, we were under this time pressure and so we couldn't squeeze it in and so we had to shoehorn it here and that's why the data's over there. Okay, all right. And you're like, okay, fine, all right, so I get the data set, you're munging the data set, you're doing machine learning or writing your scripts, whatever, all right? And then you're like, Oh yeah, by the way, there's a, what's the timestamp of this click, right? Because I need the timestamp in order to join it to this other data set that's kept in this other silo, right? And you're like, okay, fine. You ask the front end engineer. It's like, hang on, I don't remember. Um, let me go through the Git logs myself, because or the or the um, you know Jira uh, the Jira issue tracker or whatever, right? And you're like, uh, okay, oops, uh, sorry. I think we forgot to log that. All right. And you're like grumble, 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 right? And so you end up having to do like, oh, I'm gonna infer the timestamp, and then uh, there's some error associated with this, and then I'm gonna use it based on that, and then, like it starts getting to be a mess. All right. All right. So these are the serious issues and the real world problems that face you in a production environment. All right. Okay. So that's you've just gotten through all of this, right? You found the data, you done the data analysis, you clean the data, extract the features, and you built something that works. Right? All right? It works. Okay. Congratulations, you're about halfway there. All right. So what happens next, right? So what usually happens is, um, does it actually work? Because <clears throat> most of the time you start off with the data in the data warehouse that's in a retrospective task, right? But then you're like, does it actually work prospectively? Okay, so then you gotta hook it into like an A-B testing infrastructure to figure out, does it actually work on live users? So that takes another few weeks to get the results of those experiments, let's say. Right. Okay. And then here's another one. Is it fast enough? All right. So I had this really awesome experience when I first got there. This is like my second week on the job. I prototyped something out and I was really proud of it. I you know, took it to my team and said, hey, you know, it uh, query latency about 500 milliseconds, right? And I was like, I was like proud, right? Because I'm, I'm like an academic, right? Anything under running in like 500 milliseconds is awesome from my perspective. They were like, come back later after you made an order magnitude faster. Right, so does it work? Sure, it has to work first, but it also has to run fast enough. All right, okay. And let's say you've solved these two problems, right? Okay, yeah, you're about two thirds of the way there. All right. Okay, so what happens next? What happens next is you have to productionize, uh, you have to productionize whatever it is that you're building, a classifier, recommendation system, whatever. Okay, and here you host, you face another host of issues, right? So, for example, what are your job's dependencies, right? So your job depends on some other derived features so that some other team generates, right? And then you figure out they only update their values once a week but you need them up to date every day. And you're like, oh, right. So you go to the team, ask them to see if they can you know, update the values more frequently and then help them do that and blah, blah, blah. All right, so that's one issue. Another issue is, you know, what are your job's dependencies? Right, so I have A and B and C, but you know, B has to run after A or the data is not there, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so how do you schedule that? All right. And then there's, uh, are there enough resources? Okay, so my job uh, requires 10 hours to run on 2,000 Hadoop nodes every night. Uh, and there's not enough Hadoop resources, and so uh, it's gonna take 25 hours to generate recommendations on a daily basis. Okay, you can see where that's going, all right? So are there enough resources, all right? 
So um, how do you know if it's actually working, right? So you need to build in uh, monitoring uh, scripts. Like this is not, this is beyond, you know, is this service up or is this system, is this service up? It, you have to issue, do things like sanity checking, right? Does it actually give reasonable results? That's a very hard problem. And then finally, you know, who calls if it stops breaking? Well, it's, it calls you, right? Because you have to sort of manage your own systems in a production environment, right? But like, uh, how do you know when it's not working and how does, and who does it alert? And uh, the, uh, the, the, the industry calls this pager escalation, basically, right? Somebody in the data center gets page because the service is throwing exceptions and they, they, they try to trace the source and then, uh, and then somebody gets called, uh, woken up in the middle of the night to fix the system, right? How does that chain happen? Okay, so infrastructure is critical here, right? And so if you're, you know, if you're lucky enough to work in a mature company, you know, it's like, for example, like Google's got that down, uh, has all these issues down, and they've thought through all of these, and if you, if you work in a, a mature organization like that, you can essentially just plug into existing infrastructure, right? This really wasn't the case during the time I was at Twitter, basically, because we're building this infrastructure also. So we had a lot of pe teething pains trying to sort of sort through all these issues. Right, okay, and this infrastructure is what I call plumbing, right? Plumbing is critical to getting things done. All right, so um, yeah, so this is a third takeaway lesson, plumbing matters. Okay, and, and so as a summary here, I think this should all make sense now, like the three takeaway lessons I wanted to share with you, right? Make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. Constraints aren't always, aren't always technical, and the importance of doing good plumbing. Okay, all right. I, I want to move on next and in this next segment and talk about you know what are what I think is uh, interesting and what's next, right? So um, this is a very simple principle, right? I think everything becomes more interesting if you say, and I want to do it in real time. All right. So I'll give you a, a, a specific example in the context of the WTF project, right? So the WTF project, as I've told you up until now, was primarily batch processing, right? Uh, the, uh, the, results got, um, the results got loaded into HDFS, you ran a whole bunch of jobs, you cached the results and then uh, presented in the, them to the front end, right? And so um, it would be nice to have recommendations that are built on recent activity. So you can sort of think of this as like trending in your network. Okay. But the issue here is that it essentially flips the WTF problem around, right? The original formulation of the WTF problem was this. Right? For this user, at this time, what recommendation should I give? Right? But if you want to do it in a real-time streaming context, you basically have to flip the problem around, and now it becomes, for this new edge that's arrived, this new activity that's arrived, what are the, the recommendations I should be making to which users? Right? It's a complete reversal of the problem. So something that uh, we found empirically works well, and this was in a VLDB paper last year, is this, right? So A, this is you. This is who, to whom we're make, trying to make the recommendations, okay? So A follows a whole bunch of Bs, right? And then when the Bs all start following a whole bunch of Cs, that's say um, three Bs follow a C, we want to make the recommendation of C to A. Okay, so what's the insight here? Well, the insight here is that A follows B, the A follows the Bs, uh, because they're interesting, right? And we know from observation that people curate, right? So really people care about um, who they follow. And then the Bs, the people that you're following, they follow somebody because something's, something interesting is happening. So we basically, uh, it would be a good idea to essentially cut out the middlemen, cut out the middle accounts. Right, and recommend C to A so that A can follow C directly. Right? So I explained this in terms of um, activity, uh, the, uh, the follow activity, but this generalizes to any activity, retweets, um, uh, favorites, any other things. Right? Okay. And so I don't have time to go into technical solution, but it's based on these two insights. What we do is we turn this particular problem into a problem of adjacency list intersection, so essentially postings and intersection. Boolean and essentially. And then we partition the graph in such a way that you don't need to do these ands across, uh, across uh, different partitions. All right. And so this essentially is the system that is powering mobile notification. Right? So if you, um, if you use 
Twitter and you get mobile notifications once in a while that say, you know, um, my friends are tweeting about Sixa or something like that. This is a service that generates it. It launched in September 2013, um, generates billions of raw candidates, but then they get filtered down a lot because we don't want to send too many push notifications and we don't want to you know, bug people 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay, all right, so that's one example, right? So that's one example of, uh, okay, uh, WTF, user recommendations, now we want to do it in real time, all right? Okay, um, uh, this is a talk I've given before uh, at several other places, uh, doing real-time search, right? So in this particular case, it's a, uh, um, I want to do search, I want to build inverted nexus. The traditional, uh, the traditional way has been in batch mode, and then I say, okay, now I want to do it in real time. Uh, here's another interesting problem we've looked at, real-time uh, query recommendation, query suggestion. Right? Query suggestion you're all familiar with. Uh, you type in a query, it's either presented as a type ahead, here are the other queries that are related. Right? And so we want to do that in real time, reacting to the events that are happening and taking place in the, in the, in the Twitter sphere as, uh, as it happens. Right? Okay. And so everything becomes very interesting if you just say, take the existing problem, now I want to do it in real time. It becomes even more interesting when you want to integrate batch and real-time processing. So here's one of the, the, the cool stuff that's kind of on Twitter recently, and this is in a VDL, VLDB paper last year, is to come up with a framework that tries to integrate both batch and, uh, batch and streaming computations. And so uh, create a computation a framework called Summingbird uh, that allows you to essentially, uh, through some category theory tricks, there are a whole bunch of category theory geeks, basically, at Twitter. Um, they go with the Scala hipsters, basically, right? Uh, and they, they, come, they basically came up with a, an abstraction that allows you to uh, specify a computation that essentially sort of like compiles down to Hadoop if it runs in batch mode, and uh, Storm, um, uh, which is another real-time processing system, if you want to run it in real time. All right. Okay. Um, so that's, that's one thread, right? Things become more interesting if you do it in real time. Um, here's another interesting thread that I think deserves more attention. Like, if you really think about it, the tools available to data scientists today are really, really primitive. Right? So I'll run you through a scenario of what happens. Right? So uh, you write a pig script. Pig is a scripting language for big data. Uh, today you might be writing in like Spark or something like that. Right? Uh, well, Spark actually solves a lot of these problems. So let's stick with the pig script example. All right? So you write your pig script. You submit a job. All right? um, you wait because there's, uh, you have a 3,000 node cluster or a 10,000 node cluster, but there are 500 people ahead of you with jobs, right? Or something like that, right? So you wait, their job is in queue, right? You check Twitter, you have nothing to do, or you work for Twitter, right? What else are you gonna do, right? You wait some more, you're like, oh, fine, I'll send a tweet. <laughs> all right, all right, okay, and then finally my job comes back, right? And I look at the output. And usually one of two things happen. Um, you look at it because it's empty, or uh, that's because you specify the wrong join key. Right? Remember the naming things issue? You're joining on the wrong thing, the prime, none of the primary keys match, nothing. Right? After, like, after your job goes through like 10 petabytes of data, it comes up with nothing. You're like, oh, all right. The other, thing, the other thing that often happens is that you look at your job and it's generated 100 terabytes of data already, and it's still going. Right? And you're like, oh shit, I forgot to specify the join key. So it's doing Cartesian product of two data sets. All right, that doesn't work either, right? OK, all right, and then you look at the results, you know, why my result's empty, or why, have I, why, I, why am I generating, why have I generated 10 terabytes already? All right, OK, so we're going through this. And so you fix, you go back and fix these issues, right? This is not a good development cycle. So there have been recent developments that, the, that, that, that sort of try to fix a lot of these issues. Spark is a good development that gives you an interactive shell that, that makes this a lot better. But I think this is, still, um, this is still one of the problems that we need to solve, better tooling for data science and interactive data exploration. Right? So, and, and there's got to be a better way. And I think not only is it this sort of interaction cycle, but we also need to take the process all the way to visualization. Because ultimately, um, you get back some results, you want to present it in a visually compelling way to show off the insights that you're getting, right? And so here's another example that we've, to, uh, uh, another example that, uh, that we've worked on in terms of taking log data 
and distilling tens of terabytes of log data into these simple visualizations. We're generating the intermediate data and then presenting them in these simple visualizations. In this case, this is like an icicle diagram. For those of you that work on HCI, this should be fairly familiar to you. That allow you to compactly summarize and then drill down into the data. Okay, all right. The final part of the talk, if you've been falling asleep, you should wake up now, all right. So this is, um, this is one of the issues that you know, keeps me up late at night, right? What's this evolving role between academia on the one side and industry on the other? All right, so I think about it in terms of what's the role of academia and industry, right? You think about it in terms of like, why am I getting a PhD? All right, okay. So um, it all started from this, right? People started keep on, kept on asking me like, oh, so why'd you come back from Twitter? All right. Okay, and so I've been thinking a lot about this issue, academia versus industry, right? So um, one way to think about it is um, models of innovation, right? So if you uh, talk to somebody that actually studies you know, how innovation happens, um, they might tell you something like this. They might present something like a, a, a linear model. This is sort of the canonical baseline model. It's been discredited, um, and there, are, you know, doesn't really things don't really work that way. But it's still a reasonable, you know, a point of reference, right? So according to the linear model, it goes like this: you start with basic research, you move to applied research, and you move to development, right? This is the the the, the basic linear model. Right? And the theory goes, the story goes, that you know, academia is good at the basic research side, right? and industry is good on the uh, development side, and you sort of meet in the happy middle. Right? But this is really not reality. Like we're going to a lot of these conferences these days, and our, in our colleagues in industry are saying, you know, what you're working on doesn't work, is not interesting, we're just playing wrong. And that's, that's a bad state of affairs. Right? So I've been thinking about you know, what's my answer to that? You know, how should academia and industry interact? Right? And so the solution I've came up for myself that I'll share with you is this. So I start off by asking what's a real world problem that industry cares about? And then I generalize it into the, asking the question, what's the more general form of that problem? Right? So industry is really good at coming up with point solutions to specific business needs of that quarter. Right? But they're not quite as good as generalizing and solving the more general instance of that problem, not because they're not smart, but because they don't have time. Right? Once they solve the particular point solution, find a particular point solution for that particular problem, they move on to the next problem. Right? But that's where academia um, stands to benefit. Right? And so I always almost propose you know, uh, this, what's known as a reverse linear model, taking the linear model and flipping it around. Right? You start from development. You start from the real world industry problems that people care about. Right? And then you do applied research and then you do basic research, the generalization of those, uh, uh, those industry problems. Right? So I'll just give you a, a, a couple examples of this. Right? So one example is this real time search that I didn't have a chance to uh, tell you about. But while I was at Twitter, I helped out with uh, um, an indexing algorithm for real time algorithms. Right? So, um, it was a specific hard-coded technique for dy dynamically allocating postings lists right, that worked in a very specific narrow niche. Right? And I did that, uh, I helped out with that while I was working at Twitter. After I came back, um, I started thinking about the more general form of the problem. And so I asked the question, you know, for this, uh, if this was a specific hard-coded solution, what if we generalize, uh, what would we try to generalize it? What is the, what is the trade-off space look like? Right, and that led to a KDD paper. And then we asked, you know, uh, the Twitter solution had a lot of Twitter-specific hacks, like the fact that uh, you know, Twitter uh, tweets were no more than 140 characters or something like that, for, for example. Right? And so what if you remove the ha those hacks, what would a more general problem look like? And we came up with some more interesting results. Right. So, uh, and here's another example. Right, so what's a real world problem? What's a more general form of the problem? Right, so I told you about this sort of uh, you know real time recommendation algorithm. Right, uh, if a bunch of B's follow C, you want to make recommendations of C to A. Right, but if you sort of think about it, that's a specific instance of this more general problem of a motif detections on graphs. 
Right, graph motifs are certain configurations, essentially subgraph uh, pattern matching, right? So you specify a particular pattern. In this case, it's a sort of diamond configuration. And then uh, you, you want to match it in real time as a graph is growing, right? So you can imagine a more generic system that has a distributed streaming graph infrastructure, and you register uh, that, that takes all the edges that are coming in. And you can think about registering motif queries, right? Notify me when, the, uh, when this particular motif happens or when this particular uh, subgraph matches. And then you know, issue a callback trigger. And the issue uh, the callback trigger is simply make a recommendation from C to A. And so that's a more general form. Right? And you can imagine beyond this diamond motif, there, might be, there must be other motifs that are interesting. Right? So that's an example of taking a specific point solution and then generalizing it to a broader problem. Okay, uh, and, and, and so I think you know, academia and industry are vital for each other, and this is sort of one way that, that I think is a good answer to, the, to what is the role between them. Right? Okay, that's all I have. I'll leave you with this quote. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is, and I think this aptly sums up my talk. All right, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Jimmy. So we have a roving mic, and I think it would be good to use it for the questions so that they can be recorded on the video camera. Um, do we have a question for Jimmy to start off with? So can any of the things you've spoken about be independently reproduced and verified? And if not, is data science still science? Can the things, um, I believe a lot of the things can be independently verified without access to the data. And all of it can be verified if you go work for Twitter. <laughs> so that's my facetiousness. No, no, but I, I, I have tried to, to the extent I can, sort of lift up the curtain. Um, in, I gave you through um, a whole bunch of uh, papers that we've written about this. I believe that for most of these, it, uh, they can be replicated. Right. So even if you look at the graph algorithms and the performance metrics, I mean, you probably won't be able to replicate the, the exact FTR, the follow through rate. But I think you'll find that the, uh, the relative differences between the different techniques is a robust finding, for example. Right. So you might not get exactly the same result, but the conclusion is that you know, this technique is better than another. I think that will hold as a specific example. Right. Does that answer your question? Okay. Oh, the, 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 other, the other half of, you know, what is data, I don't know what data science actually is, so I don't, I don't, don't, don't get too caught up with the science part of data science, so. Yeah, I wonder if you got any advice for um, academics and students on how you actually go and find real world problems to generalize. Okay. Um, that's easy. Go do a summer internship for students, right? Um, at least in the U.S., it is almost expected that uh, for some of the summers during a PhD student's career that they'll be doing summer internships somewhere, right? Maybe not every year, but every other year so that by the time you graduate, maybe you've had a Google internship and a Facebook internship or maybe like a LinkedIn internship and a Twitter internship or something like that or one at Microsoft or something like that. So I, I think that's the, um, uh, and I think that's the, uh, that's the easiest way. And then, you know, for, for faculty, I encourage them to do, you know, what I did. Um, faculty have sabbaticals, and so go and hang out with, uh, with some, uh, uh, some, some place in industry. It doesn't have to be social media. It doesn't have to be consumer facing. It doesn't have to be one of these, you know, hell, you know the social, emerging social media uh, places, right? It could be you know, a traditional enterprise uh, company. Yeah, so, so, so I, I, I don't think it's as hard as, uh, as uh, many people make it out to be. Well, thank you very much for your speech. It's uh, and up to a very exciting uh, mm -hmm. for researchers working with the big data mm -hmm. um, to exploit uh, Twitter as a mm -hmm. data source. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it could be some recommendations be provided uh, how to store this data and which tools to use mm -hmm. and uh, how to deal with privacy of personal data. Um, thank you. So the privacy issues with Twitter are not that complicated because it's implicitly public, 
right? So all the things I described to you are all, all, all over the public tweets, right? And so I think implicit in the social contract of Twitter is that this is a broadcast mechanism, yeah. right? This is very, very different from the research ethics involved in doing like Facebook research, for example. And then, you know, um, and then that opens up a whole different can of other issues. Um, regarding storing the data, I think I would, I would recommend that you uh, go and read up on these papers. I'm happy to share their slides. I've, one of the things I've been trying to do during my time here is sort of try to share with the rest of the community um, the types of infrastructure that you need to build, at which stage, and how they sort of work. Um, so if you use Hadoop and download it out of the box, it gets you some part of the way. But you really need to build a lot of infrastructure on top. This is basically all the plumbing that I talked about. And I, I, I think I've done a fair job, a reasonable job, trying to uh, share these experiences in, in, the, in, the, in this uh, series of papers I've written over the last few years. So I would encourage uh, that as a starting point. Does that answer your question? Okay. So just take one last question. Okay, my question is on one of this uh, one of these slides you presented uh, mm -hmm. for this uh, particular topic. You said that uh, with a lot of data, uh, algorithm mm -hmm. didn't really matter much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to know: Does it mean that uh, algorithm doesn't matter if you are working with big data? And if uh, if the answer is no, uh, what do you suggest uh, to be used for big data, maybe analysis and Modeling. Okay. Well, thanks for the question. I think this is something that comes up, and let me give you a more nuanced answer to this. So, lots of studies have shown that um, that the more data you throw at it, everything else held constant, um, the performance gets better. Right? Classification accuracy. This has been shown in machine translation and language modeling, etc. Um, so, so my my argument for that is that essentially. Throwing more data at it is free, right? And it's, it's not technically free, but it's made very easy by the introduction of data sets like web crawl. So Clue Web, Common Crawl gives you a lot of the, a lot of the web data that you want. And then with the advent of uh, Hadoop infrastructure, it's now you know, fairly standard at this point to have access to Hadoop clusters. Even if you don't have the Hadoop clusters, they're online Hadoop as a service providers that aren't that expensive, right? And so I think the more nuanced argument I would give is essentially if throwing more data at the problem is free, why don't we all pick the low-hanging fruit? We're all capable of picking the low-hanging fruit, not only industry, right? So that's, that's get up to some higher level baseline, right? Data is a rising tide that lifts all boats. So that's get up there first, and then we start thinking about you know, smarter algorithms, right? And if you sort of look at this, I have no insight into Google, but this has sort of been my interpretation, right? Why have they been putting so much emphasis on you know, knowledge graph these days? It's because they ran out of data that they could crunch on, right? They have all the world's information, they threw the data at it, and they're like, okay, now you really need knowledge. Meaning smarter algorithms, right? Knowledge is just a, knowledge is just a, uh, a coded word for smarter algorithms, right? And so we should do the same thing. Let's, let's throw more data at the problem to the extent that we can, and we can now with these big data technologies that have been commoditized, right? And then, then we'll come back and talk about you know, what it is that we need to solve. Does, does it help? OK, I think that's all we have time for. Let's thank Jimmy one last time, OK? All right, great, thanks.